Welcome to section 11 of bacteria. This is our bacteria overview figure, and in this video, we'll be discussing Streptococcus pyogenes, which you can see right here. This scene will take place in someone's home as they prepare for a nice Thanksgiving meal. Most people eat pie on Thanksgiving, so we'll show a delicious looking pie front and center. Pie sounds kind of like pyogenes, so this will be our symbol for Streptococcus pyogenes. Okay, before we get too far, do you notice anything about the floor in this home? Yep, that's right. We've made the wood floor look purple to help you remember that this organism is gram-positive. This is a gram stain of streptococci. Notice that the organism stains purple, which is why it's a gram-positive organism. And also notice that the bacteria are circular or cocci-shaped and that they form long, continuous chains. For example, right here. This morphology is unique to streptococci. Next, look closely outside of the window. Can you see that they live right on the bay? Bay sounds like beta, so it will represent that Streptococcus pyogenes is beta hemolytic. This is a figure of the three types of hemolysis, which we discussed in more detail in our video on listeria. Again, beta hemolysis looks like this. Notice that there is a zone of clearing around the colony, right here. Okay, let's return to the image. Notice that we've added a coat rack with a raincoat on it. This is where you put your raincoat when you come inside the home. The phrase, put your raincoat, contains the letters PYR. So we've shown this coat rack and raincoat in the image to help you remember the PYR test. This test can identify bacteria that have the enzyme pyrrolidonyl aryl amidase. The test is performed by impregnating a test disc with the substrate. Bacteria are placed on top of the disc, and if the bacteria have the enzyme pyrrolidonyl aryl amidase, then the substrate will be hydrolyzed, causing the disc to produce a red or pink color. This test isn't very commonly used anymore, but it still shows up on test questions, so it's important to remember. Now notice that we've added a pie with a special glass covering. For most of our videos, we'll represent bacterial polysaccharide capsules with sacs, because sac sounds like polysaccharide. However, the capsule of strep pyogenes is a bit unique because it's comprised of hyaluronic acid. So we decided to represent this idea with a different symbol. The capsule of bacteria is on the exterior surface of the cell wall, and protects the bacteria from harm, just like the glass covering protects the pie from getting dried out or ruined. So in this image, we represented the unique capsule of strep pyogenes with this unique glass covering. Because it's Thanksgiving, we've shown this woman cooking in the kitchen. Unfortunately, when she opened the oven, she accidentally burned her hand. The burned skin is here to help you remember that strep pyogenes causes skin infections. One common type of skin infection is cellulitis, which is characterized by red hot skin, just like her skin is going to be after getting this nasty burn. So skin burned for cellulitis. This is an image of cellulitis. Notice the red swollen area right here, which is normally hot and painful. Now we've added another woman helping with the pies. Notice that she's pouring honey on this pie. This is to help you remember that strep pyogenes can cause impetigo. This is a skin infection that has honey-crusted lesions. So honey being poured on pie crust for impetigo. This is an image of impetigo. Notice that there are yellow, golden-appearing lesions, or honey-crusted lesions, which you can see right here. Also notice that she's holding the honey up with a hand covered by a red mitten. This is to help you remember that strep pyogenes causes erysipelas. The mitten is red and quite big, just like erysipelas is characterized by large red painful skin lesions. This is an image of erysipelas. Notice the large red painful skin lesions right here, for example, and right here on the patient's nose. Okay, now let's discuss the three toxigenic diseases of strep pyogenes. The first disease is toxic shock-like syndrome. To help you remember toxic shock-like syndrome, we've shown a baby who apparently stuck something into the outlet and is now getting shocked. Toxic shock-like syndrome is caused by a pyrogenic exotoxin, which is known as erythrogenic toxin A. The toxin is a superantigen, which just means that the toxin causes binding of MHC class II and T cell receptors, resulting in overactivation of T cells. This in turn can result in an overwhelming release of cytokines, which is clinically manifested as shock. To represent this idea, we've shown the baby wearing a cape, similar to a superhero. So superhero cape for superantigen. It's pretty obvious, but toxic shock-like syndrome causes shock. Again, we've represented this idea with the baby getting shocked. In addition to shock, toxic shock-like syndrome also causes fever. To represent this idea, we've shown the baby sweating profusely. We've also shown the baby with a red rash on his belly to help you remember that it causes a rash. The next toxigenic disease is called scarlet fever. This is also caused by pyrogenic exotoxin. To represent this idea, we've shown this woman wearing a scarf. Scarf sounds kind of like scarlet fever, so scarf for scarlet fever. One of the features of scarlet fever is a sandpaper-like rash. To help you remember this, we've shown a bunch of pie crumbs on this woman's scarf that look like little pieces of sand. This shouldn't be too surprising considering that she's been eating pie. 
so crumbs that look like sand for sandpaper-like rash. This is an image of the sandpaper-like rash. You can see the rash, for example, on this patient's arm right here. The fact that the scarf is red and around her neck should also help you remember that another feature of scarlet fever is pharyngitis. So a red scarf around the neck, just like pharyngitis, causes a red swollen pharynx. Finally, if you look closely, you can see that she's munching on a strawberry. This is to help you remember that another symptom of scarlet fever is reddening and swelling of the tongue, which is also sometimes referred to as a strawberry tongue. This is an image of the strawberry red tongue. Notice that the tongue right here resembles a strawberry. The third and final toxigenic disease is necrotizing fasciitis. This is a soft tissue infection that results in destruction of the subcutaneous fat and muscle fascia. The infection spreads rapidly and is a surgical emergency because it results in tissue death or necrosis. Necrosis results in dead, dark tissue, just like this pie is black and burned. So the burnt pie in this image should help you remember that strep pyogenes causes necrotizing fasciitis. Okay, now let's discuss some other virulence factors for strep pyogenes. Notice that we've added a woman towards the back of the image right here who is cutting up some strawberry-filled donuts. This can be a bit difficult to see, so let's zoom up. The O-shaped donuts in the image are here to help you remember streptolysin O. Streptolysin O is a toxin that degrades cell membranes and lyses red blood cells. The fact that the donuts are filled with jelly and jelly is flying all over the place should help you remember that this toxin lyses red blood cells. She's also cutting up strawberries to place them on top of the donuts. The letter S in strawberry should help you remember that another similar toxin to streptolysin O is streptolysin S. Okay, now that we've zoomed out, you can see that we've added a guy laying on the couch next to the window. If you look closely at his forehead, you can see that he has a towel on him and appears to have a fever. This guy with the fever is here to help you remember that strep pyogenes causes rheumatic fever. We've added the sign above the man with the fever that says, Welcome to the Joneses, to help you remember the complications of rheumatic fever. Jones is a mnemonic that can be useful in remembering the complications, so we've included it here as part of the image. Just so we're all on the same page, I'll quickly review the mnemonic. J stands for joints. O is shaped kind of like a heart and stands for carditis. More specifically, valvular damage, pericarditis, and myocarditis. N stands for nodules in the skin. More specifically, these are subcutaneous nodules. E stands for erythema marginatum, which is simply a rash with thick borders. And S stands for Sydenham's chorea, which are quick involuntary movements that most commonly affect the face and hands. Okay, notice that we've shown the woman on the left cutting up donuts getting a little carried away because the jelly is flying across the room and landing next to the guy on the couch. Donuts represent streptolysin O, and the jelly from the donut is landing next to the guy with the fever, so this should help you remember that streptolysin O is associated with rheumatic fever. More specifically, host antibodies against the streptolysin O toxin, or anti-streptolysin O titers, can be used to diagnose rheumatic fever. In order to hammer this point home further, we've also shown this boy examining the jelly-filled donuts in the center of the image to help you remember that streptolysin O titers can be examined to diagnose rheumatic fever. Now we've added this maid to the scene who's helping the guy with the fever. The maid here represents the virulence factor M protein. You can see that she's hushing the kids as if trying to give the guy some peace and quiet. So you could say she's inhibiting the noisy kids. This is to help you remember that M protein inhibits the host's ability to engulf and destroy bacteria. In other words, it inhibits phagocytosis. As you can tell, she cares a lot about the guy with the fever and is stroking his head. Her close relationship with the rheumatic fever guy is depicted in this way to help you remember that M protein can give rise to rheumatic fever. This happens because it elicits a very strong immune response from the host, causing the host to produce antibodies that target bacterial antigens. However, these same antigens may be very similar to antigens present in the heart. Therefore, if our antibodies bind to these antigens, it can result in carditis, which we mentioned earlier as one of the complications of rheumatic fever. This whole process is known as molecular mimicry and is high yield for step one. We've shown these kids playing with little toy cars here and being hushed by the maid to help reinforce the idea that M protein is associated with carditis. So toy cars for carditis. Now let's move on to discuss post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, or PSGN. This is a condition that's similar to rheumatic fever because it's caused by our immune system after a strep infection. Rheumatic fever is a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction, whereas PSGN is a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. A type 3 hypersensitivity reaction just means that antigen-antibody immune complexes are deposited in the glomerulus. To represent this idea, we've shown this tangled up cord by the window that looks kind of like a glomerulus. Now that we've discussed rheumatic fever and PSGN, I should mention a couple other important distinctions. 
First, rheumatic fever only occurs after strep pyogenes pharyngitis, whereas PSGN can occur after pharyngitis or skin infections. Also, rheumatic fever can be prevented with the treatment of penicillin, whereas PSGN cannot be prevented with penicillin. We'll talk about treatment more near the end of the video, but for now, let's continue discussing the story. Notice that now we've shown this bass guitar that accidentally got knocked over by these kids. Bass sounds kind of like bassitracin, so it's our symbol for the bassitracin test. Because the bass guitar is broken, we can infer that it must be fragile or sensitive. Therefore, the broken bass guitar represents that strep pyogenes is bassitracin sensitive. We discussed this figure in our Viridans group streptococci video, which was section 9, but recall that if there is clearing around a disc saturated with a compound, then the organism is sensitive to that compound. So notice that there is a large zone of clearing directly adjacent to this disc. So if this were a bacitracin disc, then the organism here would be bacitracin sensitive. For step 1, you need to know that strep pyogenes is bacitracin sensitive. Now we've shown two guys playing poker towards the front of the image. Notice that the guy on the right is really stressed out, as you can probably tell by him pulling on his tie. He's probably doing this because he's losing the poker game, and is about to lose a bunch of money. The fact that the tie is red and around his neck should help you remember that strep pyogenes commonly causes pharyngitis, or a sore throat. This is an image of group A strep pharyngitis. Notice that the pharynx appears very swollen right here. Obviously, to play poker, you need money, so we've added several pennies on the poker table. Just like in our other videos, pennies are used to represent penicillin, so the treatment for strep pyogenes pharyngitis is penicillin G. We've also shown some sapphires on the table. These are a bit more valuable than pennies and make the game more exciting. Sapphires sounds like cephalexin, so it's used in this image to help you remember that another treatment for strep pyogenes is cephalexin. This is typically used to treat skin infections, such as impetigo. Okay, now that we've covered the image, let's do a question. A 12-year-old boy comes to the office due to two days of a sore throat. A rapid antigen detection test is positive for group A streptococcus. The physician immediately prescribes penicillin due to concerns about a complication that would occur if the infection was left untreated. The complication occurs due to a virulence factor produced by the organism, which subsequently triggers an immune response. What is the most likely function of the virulence factor described? Okay, from the question stem, hopefully you notice that this boy has group A strep pharyngitis. The feared complication described is rheumatic fever. Remember, rheumatic fever occurs after strep pharyngitis and can be prevented with penicillin, which is one of the reasons why these infections are treated in the first place. The virulence factor that triggers an immune response is M protein. Like we discussed earlier, M protein elicits a very strong immune response from the host, causing the host to produce antibodies that target bacterial antigens. However, these same antigens may be very similar to antigens present in the heart. Therefore, if the antibodies bind to these antigens, it can result in rheumatic carditis. So we've described the function of M protein, but haven't yet answered the question about the function. So the answer is that it resists phagocytosis. Recall from the image that the maid hushing the kids right here represents that M protein inhibits phagocytosis. 